Hello beauties and welcome back to the Jodie Beauty channel and welcome to my first ever true crime and makeup episode. I have wanted to do this for the longest time. I am absolutely obsessed with true crime, aren't we all? To the point that I even had it written into my wedding vows. I'm not kidding. So of course I want to kickstart this series by giving credit to the queen herself, Bailey Sarian. Of course, she was the original true crime and makeup superstar. So if you don't know who she is, which I'm sure you all do, I will leave a link to Bailey down below and you should definitely go and subscribe. In this series, I've decided to focus on mainly UK cases and European cases. So I'm hoping to uncover some mysteries that you might not have heard of before so if that sounds good to you make sure you hit that subscribe button now so you get notified of all the upcoming true crime and makeup episodes just before we begin I do have to do some housekeeping this video may contain some distressing material we are going to be covering subjects like murder violence and there is some animal cruelty in this one as well I know not the animals so if you don't feel that you can handle the material of this episode then I'll see you in the next episode. Make sure to look after yourself as a first priority. So if you were a teenager in the late 2000s, you might actually be familiar with the victim of this case. Helen Bailey was a 51 year old author born on the 22nd of August 1964 in Northumberland in the United Kingdom. When Helen was at school, she absolutely loved to write. She used to come home every day and scribble down pages and pages in her diary, just writing, and that was her like main passion while she was at school. She didn't really fit in at school, and writing for her was her escape and her release to the world. When she grew up, she studied physiology at Thames Polytechnic, college I think it's a college is it university it must be university and that's in London her dream at that point was to become a forensic scientist but when she got more involved in those kind of career paths she realized it really wasn't for her so she decided to take a job in media marketing in London so Helen had a pretty cool job she was doing the licensing for things like the Rugrats, um, Nintendo, Garfield, some really, really big brands. And while she was working in London in the 90s, this is where she met her husband, John Sinfield. In 1996, they got married and they moved together in London. Friends say that John really saw the creativity that Helen had and he really encouraged her to write. He really saw talent there, and this gave Helen the confidence to move forward and really put her all into writing. This led Helen to have a really successful career in writing. She published over 20 books, and she had an especially famous series called The Extraordinary World of Electra Brown, and this is what set her into fame and was published between around 2008 and 2010. Unfortunately though, tragedy was just around the corner. In 2011, John and Helen took their dream vacation to Barbados. John went swimming while Helen remained on the beach and unfortunately he got caught in a riptide. Helen could see he was in trouble in the water and she called for help, but unfortunately by the time the help got there, John had already drowned. I can't even imagine the loss. They'd been together for 22 years at this point and had been married for 15 years. Not only that, but Helen was completely alone in a country she didn't really know, with no one to support her, and she had to stay there and repack all John's belongings. One of Helen's friends said that the hardest thing for Helen was coming back on the plane with John's suitcase and having to bring it into her house. I mean, how heartbreaking is that? You know, it must have been one of the toughest things that anyone could ever go through. So when Helen returned to the UK, she did what she knew best. She wrote. And this led to her creating this blog called Planet Grief. So as the name suggests, Planet Grief became a 
outlet for Helen and it also attracted lots of people that were also going through grief as well. It got quite a big community on there and people used to follow Helen's blogs and know about her life and also write about their own experiences with grief. One of the people that got in touch with Helen through the website was a man around her own age with two adult sons and his name was Ian Stewart. He had also recently lost his wife. So they connected on this shared grief and after talking online for a while, they actually started to meet up and a relationship developed. So the meetups turned into romance and before long, they were moving in together. So Ian didn't want to move to London. So Helen decided to move to Hertfordshire with him and his two sons. And they also lived with her dog, <coughs> Boris Adashand. On April 15th, 2016, uh, the police received this phone call from Ian Stewart. I'll play it now. Oh, she please, so can I help? Hello there. My partner has been missing since Monday and not contacted anyone. Oh, she left a note. She said she said in the note something like, I need space and time alone. I'm going to Broadstairs. Please don't contact me in any way. But in Broadstairs, she's got, we've got a, a cottage down there, but we people have been down there with neighbours and she hasn't, she's not there. I haven't been there either. As you just heard from the call, Ian is reporting that Helen has gone missing and that she's left a note telling him that she doesn't want to be contacted and that she's going to a property in Broadstairs in Kent, a holiday home that they had there. He also mentions that she doesn't want to be contacted because she's writing a book and yeah, I mean, I suppose it sounds like pretty plausible that an author would want to do that. However, after two days of absolutely no contact from Helen, her brother starts to get a little bit concerned. Although he doesn't think it's that strange that Helen might go away, he finds it strange that Helen would go away and leave absolutely no contact at all. When Helen hadn't rang him or texted him back, he really started to get concerned and that's when he contacted Ian, her husband. That's when Ian told him about the note and that she'd gone to Broadstairs. So with that, her brother went off to go and have a look in the cottage to see if she was there. But when he got to Broadstairs, he found absolutely no trace of Helen, no trace of Boris, and it didn't look like anyone had been there. So with the pressure from Helen's brother, that's why Ian made the call that we just heard. And yeah, a missing person's report was filed. Of course, because there was this note, there wasn't much urgency in it. Helen was a grown adult and she'd just left a note to say she'd gone somewhere and she wasn't there at the time. So the police at that point just assumed she was missing for now and she would turn up at some point. But as a lot of you guys will know, when somebody goes missing like this, there's normally some sort of digital trace. They'll pick up their phone, they'll send an email, they'll use their bank card. And after a few days, there just didn't seem to be any activity from Helen. And even stranger, there didn't seem to be any preparation for her leaving. So she hasn't withdrawn a big sum of money before she went. It was just like a ghost. She didn't have any trace of any activity anywhere. So after 11 days of absolutely nothing, they decide they need to go and ask Ian a few more questions about if she has any enemies or maybe she was upset of something that was going on in her life. They literally just needed to cover any instance of what could have happened. They asked Ian questions about whether Helen was emotionally stable, had she been acting differently recently, did she have anyone that might have a grudge on her? Ian couldn't really give any answers. It was hard to put together what had happened. This is why I can't remember very well. I'll tell you what I can remember, but what some of what I can remember is maybe what I've said since and when I've looked at my diary. And it was pretty close to one to go. And then I'm not sure that this is right, this is the I'm not sure who's right. At some point I saw the mail on my desk from Helen. And at some point I had to dash out because I was late, so I could see I could be late, so I'd dash out. I'm pretty sure Helen waved goodbye to me, but when I think back, I'm not so sure. So maybe she did, maybe she didn't. So I either went to the doctors or the dump, or maybe I went to the dump the next day. Okay, not be, I'm not sure. So days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months, and no one could really 
see why Helen had disappeared. I mean, this became pretty high profile in the UK press. Even JK Rowling shared Helen's disappearance on her social media. So yeah, it, it was going pretty far and wide and still there was no sign of Helen. Of course, the whole of the local area was completely searched. They went through all the woods, the fields, everything that you'd expect. And they even asked the neighbors to check the sheds just to see if Helen had somehow got stuck somewhere or, you know, was in need. Of course, the neighbors also rallied around Ian at this traumatic time for him. He looked tired and lost and just a shadow of his former self. Helen's phone hadn't been found, so of course, this was a real focus of the search. They were hoping that Helen's phone might reconnect to the signal, and this might give a clue to like where she'd gone or where she was. But unfortunately, the phone just didn't connect, didn't connect, and there was no, there was no trace of the phone. But then the police got some hope because on the 16th of April, Helen's phone had actually connected to the Wi-Fi at the Broadstairs cottage where her note said she'd gone. So of course, this meant the police went back to the Broadstairs cottage and did a thorough search, but there's still no sign of Helen and they had no idea where she was. But because the phone had caught signal, this really reignited the case. The police really wanted to search everything that they could have possibly missed. So they went back to that paper trail and went all through Helen's banking and they started to see some interesting things. So Helen had a standing order that used to go from her account every month. And the amount that used to be on the standing order used to be 600 pounds. And this had increased to 4,000 pounds a month. So they looked into this standing order and they found out that this was going into Ian and Helen's joint bank account. Interesting. They also found another transaction, a transaction for the Arsenal season ticket. A ticket that was in Ian's name. I think we can kind of see where this might be going. Of course, this new information meant that the police were looking to have a little chat with Ian. So, imagine their surprise when they go to Ian's house and they find out he's on holiday. Oh, Ian. So, I feel like most people could label going on holiday when your wife is missing, well, your fiance, when your fiance is missing, an interesting idea, but you know, a couple of days to get away from it all. I mean, he did seem quite stressed, but no, Ian hadn't just gone on a weekend away. Oh no, he's gone on a two week holiday to Spain. Two weeks, interesting decision. But the police decide to, you know, play it cool and they were waiting for Ian when he got back. Let's run that clip. Okay, we're arresting you on suspicion, suspicion of the murder of Helen Bailey. Are you joking? And of disposing her body in a manner which would likely to instruct the coroner and the theft of money of Helen Bailey. Okay, so you do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do a mention in question from the you later on in court. Anything you do say may be given evidence. Do you understand that? Oh, yes, sir. So as you can see from the clip, they arrested Ian for murder, but there is one issue. Where's the body? So in the UK, you can only hold someone for so long. So everybody in the police force really needed to find that body and a massive search began. Not only did a search begin, but they really wanted to narrow down what Ian's exact movements were on that April the 11th day. So one of the first things that Ian did that day is he went to the doctors. And what was interesting about this appointment is Ian didn't make his first appointment in the morning. He rang the surgery and he said that he was having car trouble and he couldn't get there. So he actually rearranged his appointment to 3 p.m. that afternoon. The doctor that saw Ian said that Ian seemed a little bit off to him, like a little bit snappy. And yeah, that was hit the end of the doctors. But then Ian decides after the doctors that he's going on a little trip to the tip. I don't know if you, what you call that in the US. Is it like, um, it's like a waste disposal center basically. And this is where Ian went and disposed of a duvet. Hmm, interesting. 
The third stop on Ear's agenda was a trip to the solicitor's office. And here he was discussing with the solicitor about the sale of one of Helen's many properties. So Helen was selling a house in Newcastle and when he went to go and see the solicitor, the solicitor refused to push the sale through of this house because it was Helen's and everything was in Helen's name. And he says, the solicitor says, that Ian started getting a little bit aggressive and he wasn't very happy about this. But there was nothing more that he could do for Ian, so Ian left. So Ian goes back home and not sure what he was doing at home at this point, obviously. Um, but the next time he leaves the house is at 9 p.m. and he goes to see his son. So Ian's son used to play bowls at the same time, same place every single week. So Ian actually just turned up. This is very spontaneous and it wasn't really like Ian. Um, but yeah, he turned up and he took his son for a Chinese and they had dinner. And yeah, that was kind of the end of that. So this takes us full circle to Helen's disappearance, then there being a two day gap. And then Helen's brother getting so concerned, he starts to ask a lot of questions. And then there's another two days before Ian actually makes the phone call to report this to the police. So thinking back to that phone call now, doesn't it seem strange when Ian has asked all these questions about Helen, about like her height and her hair color and her date of birth? And what's her date of birth? Oh, crikey. God, she, she found me there. 20 seconds. Right, just let me double check. One second. Oh, God. I'm sorry, I'm just double checking. You, as you asked that, it just went straight out of my head. What's her height initially? Oh, I'm going to guess here. I don't know where she has told me, but she's probably 5'10", just something like that. And her eye colour? Her eye colour? Oh, my God. How do you forget these things? <laughs> I don't know at the moment. Sorry, it's just gone I'm out of my head. Blank. That's no problem. He just seems like he doesn't know any of the answers. It's pretty weird, right? I mean, you could blame that on, maybe obviously his wife's missing, he's flustered. If you're stressed, sometimes your mind can go a little bit haywire. There's also this little issue about this note. Well, nobody had seen this note and it was never found again. And Ian said he had disposed of it. Which seems a little bit like curious. It's like quite a strong note i don't feel like i would just throw that away do you well as the police are putting this all together you might remember that i said that ian was pretty exhausted with the searching and even though the neighbors rallied around he didn't really get in that involved himself well there was one day he did decide to go to the search and that was april 16th and ian decided he was going to go and check the cottage in broadstairs well, you might remember that date because that date was the date that Helen's phone connected to the wife. So now we're starting to see a slightly clearer picture of what might have happened. You know, the police start looking at a motive and there is plenty of motives here. As we said, Helen was a very successful author. She owned so many properties she was a very, very wealthy lady. Looking at Helen's will, Ian was gonna be the one to get the whole estate. And we're talking this millions, millions of pounds, you know, big, big money. So there's your motive. So when we look back at the footage of Ian being arrested, he starts to say some really strange things. And one of them is he keeps Going on about the garage door being open. Oh, well, the garage door's open. And it's quite a peculiar thing because obviously you're just being arrested for the murder of your wife. I mean, I don't know why you would be so overly concerned about this garage door being open, you know? So obviously everything goes back to Ian's house for the searching. They've only got four days to get this guy. They need a confession, they need some evidence and they've got nothing so far. And they're coming to the end of their fourth day and they really haven't found anything. And the neighbor comes over and she's, you know, there's a lot of banging going on. It's gone on for days and she's just like, oh, when's this gonna stop? Somewhere within this conversation, she starts to mention a cesspit that's in the garage. And actually the police weren't aware of this cesspit being there. So they go straight to the garage and what had happened is Ian had parked his car, his Jeep, 
over the top of the cover for this cesspit. So the pleas start draining and searching the cesspit and unfortunately within two hours they had unfortunately uncovered the body of Helen Bailey and next to her was her dog Boris. So the autopsy found that Helen had died of suffocation. I think one of the worst things about this case is they couldn't actually decide whether Helen had died of suffocation before she was put in the cesspit or whether it was that she'd been actually put in there alive. Um, they couldn't actually determine that in the autopsy, but it's just horrific, horrific to think that that's what might have happened to her. And of course, Boris as well. They also found a ton of Zopiclone, which is a sleeping pill in her system. And this is something that you have to be prescribed in the UK. You can't just pick up Zopiclone, you have to get it prescribed. And Helen didn't have a prescription for this drug. Does she take any sort of medication that she critically needs, do you know? No, she's, she's not. She Actually, I've want, been wanting her to go to the doctor because of why, but she won't go to the doctor. The only medicine she takes is what she buys over the internet, things like herbal stuff, vitamins, that sort of stuff. Oh, OK, no problem. But guess who did? Ian. So when they were pulling together evidence for the case, they started looking through, you know, Helen's Google search history, just trying to put together, you know, what kind of life they were living together before this all happened. And one of the top searches was, why am I so tired all the time? And friends and family also said that Helen had complained about being sleepy in the afternoons and not being able to stay awake and do her work. And this was just really unusual for Helen. Normally she was very energetic and lively and creative and had a lot of passion in her work, enough to, you know, keep her awake in the afternoon. During the autopsy, they found that this drugging wasn't a one-off thing either. Over the course of how your hair grows, they can analyze it and see what drugs you've been taking. And she had been taking this Zopiclone every day, or basically Ian had been drugging her with the Zopiclone every single day for months, working up to this point. So definitely premeditated, right? So of course Ian was arrested and he pled not guilty. So his trial was set for 2017. And this is where it starts to get a little bit <laughs> unbelievable. Hold your hats for this one, guys. So when Ian was called to trial, he didn't take any defense, which is, you know, a real mistake. We, you know, we watch enough crime series to know that definitely get a lawyer, even if you're innocent, go get a lawyer. But when he took the stand, Ian came out with a story that no one had heard before. He said there were two people that had kidnapped Helen. Nick and Joe, and they were holding her for ransom for half a million pounds. And if he didn't pay them, then they were going to kill Helen. And that's why he was pushing through the sale of the flat. And yeah, that's why he was transferring money to himself. Okay, Ian, okay. He also said he had spoke to her on the 15th, so she was alive then. Of course, the court didn't really take this uh, version of events, shall we say. The defense also called forward two people called Nick and Joe that Ian knew and perfectly matched the descriptions of what Ian had given of these two men. When asked if these were the two men that he'd meant because the descriptions matched them so perfectly, of course Ian denied it, but it was quite obvious that this fabrication was based on these two people that he knew in real life. So very creative, Ian, very creative indeed. I mean, Ian's story was actually just called absurd by the court. So you can see just how well down it went with the jury. And of course, he was found guilty of the murder of Helen Bailey. Ian got a life sentence and he will serve a minimum of 35 years. So he will be 90 by the time he gets out. So you might think that's where the story stops, but oh no, 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 it's not. And you may remember that Helen and Ian met through Helen's grief blog. He was married before to a lady called Diane and she died young because of her epilepsy or so they thought. 
But after Helen's death, her death has been reinvestigated. It was launched as a case and they started looking more into it. And get this, Ian is now going to stand trial for Diane's death in March 2022. So obviously the police feel like there could be enough evidence to actually prove that Ian didn't just murder Helen, his second fiance, but also his first wife. Guys, isn't that just the craziest twist ever? Like if you're watching this after March 2022, you're going to know how that trial goes, but the police must have some new evidence to charge him and make him stand trial. So we're actually gonna find out if he did that to his first wife, Diane. And you know, maybe Helen's death unfortunately led to that truth unraveling, but maybe there might be some justice for Diane in the future if that is what happens, of course. So guys, what a crazy, crazy case. And to know it might not even be over yet, it's just, <sighs> wild so from the time of filming this it's going to be about four months until we maybe know the outcome of that case it might go on for longer i'm not sure but yeah um i will definitely keep you updated on my community tab i will obviously be posting the results of that case on my social media to update this video so if you want to know what happens in the case of ian stewart and whether he murdered his first wife diane then make sure to subscribe I really appreciate every single one of you that subscribes. You really make my day and give the video a big thumbs up. I'd love to know your feedback on my new series. If you're loving it, drop me a comment. And if there's any cases that you know of that you want me to do some further investigating into, then I'd love to hear them. So drop those in the comment section down below as well. But until next time, I will see you in the next one. Mwah.